Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. Welcome to Catholic Mysticism, where Al Belosky talks about the supernatural aspects of our faith, the saints, and other related subjects. Now, here he is, Al Velosky. Welcome back, Al. Okay, Bob. Um, as we, we know, if we've been listening to the programs, that we deal with the mystical aspect of the Catholic Church in uh, many of the programs. And, you know, that mysticism, and I touched on this, uh, oh, when we first started on one of the shows on prayer, which we kind of like to revisit, because that's what the true mysticism is. It certainly is in the supernatural miracles, the apparition, the Eucharistic miracles, the Shroud of Turin, all these things. But it, the mysticism that we're looking for as Catholics is a deeper prayer life to get that mystical union, which will give us a deeper and more personal relationship with God. And that's what we want to try to obtain through our prayer. Now, <clears throat> that being said, when we do our rosaries, our Divine Mercy chaplets, um, prayers to St. Joseph for particular saints that we have a devotion to, those are all great. You know, those are the prayers that we've grown up as Catholics or we've learned, and they're extremely powerful. Now, we know that the rosary is a mystical journey to the mysteries of Christ when we pray certainly the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious, and the mysteries, the luminous mysteries of light. So if we're praying that and trying to concentrate, what we will do is we will be taken on a journey of the mysteries of that revelation that Christ brought, brought through his, um, for instance, on the sorrowful, his passion, his agony, and what that brought us. And on the... Uh, Glorious mysteries, we experience that joy, the victory of the resurrection, and uh, life overcoming death through Christ's sacrifice, through those mysteries of the passion and the sorrowful mystery. So when we meditate on those, and we'll explain about meditation a little later, we want to really get into that spirit so we can focus on those mysteries and what Christ is telling us. And this is an extremely powerful, powerful prayer of the rosary. You know, when the Virgin Mary appeared as we celebrate this 100th year of Fatima in 2017, that that was the weapon of choice to not only end World War I, but with some other conditions to stop World War II from also happening. And as we know, of course, that did not happen. But that rosary is that powerful that it can suspend these laws of nature and, and literally stop wars. So this is what is a, such a powerful prayer, and I'll give you a couple for instances. Um, the Battle of Lepanto, which happened, I believe, in 1571, and was pivotal for Christianity to survive when the Muslims had a tremendous naval fleet, tremendous naval fleet, the most powerful in the world at that time, and they were to do battle with the Christians who were vastly undermanned and did not have that type of navy. And this important sea battle, a pivotal battle in Western civilization and for the fate of Christianity, was enacted on the seas where you would think that the Muslims, and did, have a distinct advantage. And how could this possibly be that they could be victorious when the Muslims were regarded, regarded, highly regarded for this navy and their expertise in this type of warfare. And the Pope at that time had called for Europe to do a rosary and to do a prayer. And that's what he wanted, that rosary done. And sure enough, when it looked like the tide of battle was going to go against the Christians, a wind blew up. And it dispersed and got the Navy ships of the Muslims all scattered. And the Christians were able to overcome and conquer them. And, of course, 
Christiana survived with that major victory, and as we know, it's still flourishing today, our Christian Catholic faith. Now, the Pope at that time, and that's how we got our Feast of the Rosary in that October uh, date, because he credited Our Lady with that victory over the uh, Muslim Navy. So, big victory. Christianity survives as it does today, and we still continue that tradition with Our Lady of the Rosary. So it was very powerful in the Battle of Ponto. And if you do some research on it, or G.K. Chesterton wrote a very famous poem on the Battle of Ponto. But you can, uh, there's books on it. You can check it out, certainly through the Internet and some of the websites. It, it's just a fascinating story. And one of the things that struck me about Lepanto was how all of Christianity united to become strong. You know, we've been talking on the last couple of shows about unity especially with everything going on in our country and in the world. And it's really important that we work together as human beings and unify and not be separated and segmented as the father of lies would have us do, the devil. So Christian unity had a strong faith at that time, and they were able to bond together to accomplish with Our Lady's intercession many, 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 many uh, miracles uh, through that battle of Lepanto where we... We uh, survived. So that's one thing. A couple of other ones. Um, you know, there was this college woman that was just starting her college career. And her grandmother was a very faithful Catholic and told her that she would pray the rosary for her safety and protection. And she went to a college down in Gainesville, Florida. And this is years ago now, and some of you might remember the name that's going to come up here. But her, ro- her grandmother continued to pay this rosary. And on one particular night, when she was in her dorm, an intruder broke in with a baseball bat and killed two girls. He approached her room, but did not enter and left. And later, when the police caught him and questioned him, he said that there was this mysterious force that he did want to go in that room and, co- and commit that murder but there was this mysterious force that held him back, and he left. Well, that killer's name was Ted Bundy. And if you're old enough to remember, he was one of the most, uh, unfortunately, prolific serial killers that uh, the United States has ever had. So there's an example of the rosary. And I was just reading last week where uh, there was a uh, man who was Catholic, raised Catholic, but he was... Like many people, like many Catholics, as he grew older, he broke away from the faith and just didn't practice any, you know, going to Mass or any of the devotions or anything uh, to do with God in our church. But he went to a meeting that was held by a Fatima council, and slowly but surely, he came back to the sacraments. He made his confession, he got interested in the rosary and started praying the rosary. Well, on 9-11, he was in the Twin Towers, and he heard the fireball and the explosion, and he could hear the screams of the people, and he knew he had to run and go downstairs, and he made his way down the stairwell and started running, trying to find open doors, but the fire doors were locked on the floor that he was at. And instead of panicking, he sat down, pulled out his rosary, and asked for the Blessed Mother's intercession. And he then he heard noise coming up the stairwell, and the firemen were able to open the doors on the floor he was at and lead him to safety. So you can see there's power in these rosaries, and I'm sure if you've been having this devotion to rosary and you've been praying for a while, you've got many stories too to tell, of, to tell like that. So... You know, it's a powerful prayer, and we don't want to eliminate the rosary from any of our devotions as we're going to explore what I was talking about earlier at the opening of the show with uh, more of a a, uh, personal prayer from the heart. So we don't want to stop the rosary, and we don't want to stop the Divine Mercy Chaplet because, like, again, the Divine Mercy Chaplet given by Jesus himself to St. Faustina is an extremely powerful prayer. I mean, the Lord gave us the Our Father, another extremely powerful prayer. When you take and segment that apart and really carefully listen 
and pray with your heart on what those words are that the Lord gave us in the Our Father. It's the same here with the chaplet. And again, I think for those that have been paying the chaplet for a while, you can you can tell the stories. You know, uh, Jesus made one of the promises, Saint Faustina, that whoever prayed that prayer while a person was dying, like say you went to a hospital and your loved one or someone you didn't know, you overheard that they were dying or going to die, you pray that chaplet. Jesus promised Saint Faustina that he would stand between that individual dying and the Father as the God of divine mercy. And that's pretty powerful. So we don't want to give up those chaplets, especially um, for the dying. And also for your special, uh, whatever devotion prayers you have to particular saints, like I have one uh, to St. Cattery that I try to pray every day. It's eight Our Fathers, eight Hail Marys, and eight Glory Bees. And then, uh, of course, St. Cattery became a saint when they had the chaplet. She was just a blessed, so we're praying for those Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be for her sainthood, which happened. But you can pray for other blessed you might know or use it for the intentions you want if you choose to do that St. Cattery Chaplet. And like I mentioned, that's eight Our Fathers, eight Hail Marys, eight Glory Bees, Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be. So those are powerful too. We all have our particular saints. But what we're going to now explore, though, is that, that mystical type of prayer that tries to get us into the highest form. And this can happen as a gift from God or it may not. But that's the contemplation that we speak. But I want to offer up um, sort of some tips. Not that I am any contemplative expert or anything like that, because I'm not. And I, some of the things that I'm going to uh, talk about on the program tonight, I'm learning and trying myself. So we're both going to take this great journey together. So, what are we saying here? We're talking about a prayer that is our gut-felt, heart-felt prayer, one that utters from our soul in our lips with our being. It's not anything we may plan. It's just something that in, in comes up in us, wells up in us, and through a plea or through whatever that is, a petition or a thanksgiving or praise to God, it's just spontaneous, and it dwells up from within us. And we're going to look at that and try to see how we can try to do that. Now, that's something we cannot really, um, as I said, it's a gift from God. It's not something like, uh, like, say, baseball practice where we can practice our hitting and fielding and base stealing, get better, and, and hone our skills. Because this is a gift from God, we, it's, it's entirely his. And we have to have an open heart to do that. So one of the things that I, I'd like to suggest is that we've got to look at God, especially if you fall into one of these two car- uh, categories. Do we look at God as a taskmaster or as a loving father who is benevolent and kind to us? Because that's very important, I believe, in our prayer life. Because if we look at him as a taskmaster, as the Lord of creation that keeps a, a, a demerit list upon us, then we, will, we may have some serious problems with this type of interior or heartfelt prayer and response and be able, of course, to listen to God because that's the other factor we want to bring in. When we have a communication with Jesus trying to build that personal relationship, we've got to realize it's a two-way conversation. We're, not going to, we're going to try not to dominate the conversation. If you're anything like me, it's very easy to do that. We're going to try and have a conversation with Jesus, but also set aside time to listen to him so we can grow in that union. But if, if we view God as, some, uh, as, as a God, as a deity that can't be questioned, that we just accept God is God and that's it. And whatever he does, that's it. And I don't need to answer any questions. I don't have any questions. We, we may not be able to have that type of interior uh, prayer life that will bring us closer to him. Because certainly we can pray. We can do the devotions. We can go to Mass. We can try to get caught up in ministries. We can do, and that's the key word, do many things. 
But those things may or may not bring us closer to Jesus. And that's what we're trying to do. Because if we can get this mystical union with him, we will learn, and I'm far, far from this, that he is all we need. That no matter what, God is, and he has our well-being and our lives, not just our spiritual and our eternal lives, but our lives right now in his hands. And that's what we're going to try to explore because we, we want to have that kind of confidence. We want to have that kind of trust. And again, it's personal opinion. In, in, I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels like this. If, if you look at God as a taskmaster, then we may not be able to break through that wall because we'll always look at that demerit list as things we need to do to check that the good things we do, okay, there's a good mark for me against the demerits, a bad mark for me, and sort of try to weigh the scales of justice that we believe God does. And we've got to be careful with that. Because I think deep down, deep down, we know when we look at the passion of Christ, we look at what Jesus did as a sacrifice on Calvary for us, how could he be a taskmaster with that much love? How could he endure so much pain, so much suffering, give up, become one of us to give up his life, born to die so that he could save us and open the gates of heaven that were closed? And if we really take that into prayer and really take that into heart, slowly but surely I think we'll come to realize that he is that benevolent father. Now this may be tough for some that may have had fathers that abused them, that may have had fathers that abused drugs or alcohol, that weren't the best of fathers. And in their humanness, they failed tremendously. And we also have the Virgin Mary that we can turn to for folks like that. But we've got to realize that in all the weaknesses that our human fathers have, we've got to try and pray and open up our heart and open up that wall that's uh, been built, and this is very difficult at times, to realize that our Heavenly Father is not our human father. And for people that have a father image, that's tough to accept. But through prayer and small, small steps, we may be able to break through that wall where we can see the loving Father for which He is. And I believe that some of this... Um, mystical union that we get through God with prayer from the heart can accomplish that because God through his Holy Spirit will fill our heart and soul to open up the wisdom and knowledge we need to see this in our heart and take it from the head to the heart. Because a lot of the things that we do by rote, at least for me, or just something we've got to get done at the end of the day, a certain amount of set prayers, that can actually make us slaves. Because we look at God like that as a taskmaster, and I've got to get this rosary done today. I've got to get this chapel done today. I've got to get seven Our Fathers done today. I've got to get this prayer done today. I've got to do this today. I've got to do this. Oh, I didn't like the candles. You're going to end up like you won't be friends with Jesus. You'll be more like that master-slave relationship, and that's not what God wants, and that's not what really you want. And... That's why we want to try and get away, and again, I'm not saying take away the devotional prayers, the rosary, or chaplet, they're important, but to set aside time to just let spontaneous prayer and prayer from the heart and soul reach our Lord. You know, one of those prayers that we can go, and we're going to talk about this through Scripture, is when Peter was sinking during the storm, when he tried, he saw, they saw the apostles, Jesus walking on the water, and Peter, with great faith first, leapt out of the boat and was able to walk on the water. And then, as he looked around him, what did he see? <laughs> the raging seas, the wind, the, the noise of the howling wind, and he lost it, and in he went. And in a simple, heartfelt prayer, with everything he had, He's a, Lord, save me. And that can be a simple prayer like that. The Psalms are like a lot of that. 
their praise, their thanksgiving, their petition, you know, their hymns, but they come from the heart if you read the Psalms. They come from the heart. And these are the type of petitions that we're going to try through Scripture and, and uh, to try and get to open up that we can look at Scripture and begin to pray with Scripture. And one of the, uh, the book I recommend, it's a gem, is called Praying Scripture for a Change, an Introduction to Lectio Divina by Dr. Tim Gray. Uh, I'll repeat that title. Praying Scripture for a Change, an Introduction to Lectio Divina by Dr. Tim Gray. It's really a gem. It's not a big book. I don't even know if it's over 100 pages, but it's, it's a very good book. And what he tries to get us to do is to look at God as a benevolent Father and to approach Scripture as something that we should. And what is that? Is it a book that was written 2,000 years ago to the ancients that applied to them and their particular time, and that was it? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, it was written for a particular time for those particular ancients and what they were undergoing. However, however, it's also God's Word, which doesn't know a time. So therefore, it's timeless and it's relevant today as it was for those ancients 2,000 years ago, it's relevant for us today in our time, in our problems. And what we want to do is open that door to go through to where we want to look at Christ and let him fill us with an understanding through his word, which is scripture. And what's nice about this is, you know, guys like Dr. Tim Gray or Dr. Scott Hahn, I mean, they can, they can blow you out of the water, right? I mean, if you know these guys, you know, they can tie all the threads of the Bible from the Old Testament to the New. They can show you the parallels, the same wor words, what Jesus was trying to say, what he's trying to do. You know, all the details and all the fine print, so to speak, they can bring forth. And it's, to me at least, and probably to you, it's overwhelming. I mean, how are we ever going to get like that? Well, the point of the matter is we don't have to. We don't, we don't have to do that to pray from the heart and have this type of relationship with Jesus. The key is we have to start somewhere. And, you know, what we want to do is pray to the Holy Spirit to open up Scripture to us so that a, a sentence or a paragraph or one of the parables or just even a word, okay, it jumps out at us when we pray to the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls to see, hear, and understand what Jesus wants us to of this particular passage. Okay? You might want to start with the daily readings or a psalm or quiet, pray to the Holy Spirit, wait a minute or so in silence, see if he gives you a scripture verse, a page number of the Bible, or even just flip through, and when you feel inspired to stop at the particular point in the scripture and read that page and see what jumps off. And when I say jump off, that's what I mean. It'll hit you like a ton of bricks. That will be for you. And when you do this, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's easier, I think, to experience than to explain. Like this morning, I was reading one of the Psalms. And I was going through, and it, it struck me that this was what, for me, this morning, what it was, that Moses and the prophets called to God as well as Samuel, and God heard and listened. And boy, did that strike me. I said, my gosh, and this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Let me give you kind of an example. So that hit me, and I was like, yeah. Moses, the prophets, all those people, they called to God. That God that gave us the Ten Commandments, that led them out of Egypt, that performed all those miracles, that took care of Pharaoh, that 
gave us Jesus, that walked through the Gospels, that gave us the Eucharist, that gave us this great church we belong to, this holy church. It's the same God. And I'm in good company because those uh, pinnacles of Scripture, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, King David, all of them called to God. And he listened to them. And they were able to have this conversation. And it struck me this morning, and this was just a couple of sentences. It struck me this morning that this God is the same God with those pinnacles of the faith that listens to my prayer. And who the heck am I? Who the heck am I? I'm not in Moses or David's league or Samuel's league or any of them or the apostles, Mary Magdalene, you name it, the Blessed Mother, St. Cattery. But he hears me when I call to him and he listens to me. And that's the same as it was thousands of years ago to this very day, this Wednesday, 2017. It is awesome because I really believe that, that God bends an ear from heaven as much as he declared about the Jewish nation being enslaved and led them out of Egypt, he cares about little old me enough that he will listen to my prayer when I call to him, my benevolent, loving Father. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And that's what we're going to try. And boy, you know, you feel your heart and spirit just boom. And that's what we're looking for. Because I felt very close to God. And I did, you know, for me, I'm one of those doers that says, okay, I got to get this and I got to get that done, you know? One of those type A's personalities we hear about. And that got me just peace and just a smile on my face because it was happiness and joy. Because, again, this God of the creation. The one who created the stars and the moon and the tides and the seas and the, sto- the storms, the animals. He, he hears me. And that means he hears you, brothers and sisters. And he listens to us. He listens to us. And if that's true, and it is, I absolutely believe that's true, then he has our well-being out for us. And for those that have that father image, please try to believe that. Even if you're undergoing something tremendous and it seems that you cannot, you cannot break through, please try to understand and pray for that gift that God does love you, that he does care for you, and he has your well-being as well as all of us in his hands. And then we pray to get the trust because this was the other thing that came to me is that we need to accept the fact, and this is hard as human beings, especially in the technological age in which we live where so many innovations and wonderful things, especially in medicine, are being done. And most of us, we really love and embrace life and we want to hang on to it. And, we, you know, if it's not going to be where our, our well-being, that we're going to see it here in this life, then we've got to trust in him that he'll make it right in the next. And that's, that's tough. It's tough for me at times. I'm sure it's tough for you. But I think the more we truly pray and the more we're, our hearts and souls are opened up to that belief, we're going to get a lot of peace and joy because we're going to really believe it. I've mentioned this, this story a couple times, so I don't want to go too, too far on it. But, you know, St. Bernadette of the apparitions at Lourdes, where the, the Blessed Virgin Mary in France appeared to her 18 times, St. Bernadette had a very difficult life here on earth, very difficult. And the Virgin Mary told her right up front in the apparitions, I cannot promise you happiness in this life, but in the next. And she didn't have a happy life. That's an understatement. If you read her life, you'll see some of her sisters thought uh, because of her celebrity that she didn't want to do work and they ostracized her and she suffered with a like a ulcer on her leg that she never said anything and they thought she was dogging it when she was, they were having to do their work for the day. And, and instead she was in tremendous pain and suffering. And then she died a young death. I believe it was 24 or so. So, you know, 
it was tough for her. But you can rest assured that St. Bernadette, for all that suffering, boy, she's up there in hell, heaven. Oh, and the joy that she must have. Because, you know, I'm one of those people. This isn't, uh, I believe, a church teaching, but I'm one of those people that believe sometimes that some people have their purgatory, and this is my personal opinion now, okay, not a church teaching, for what it's worth. Some people do their purgatory time here on earth, I think, sometimes, that they suffer so much, or they've got so much, you know, two strikes against them, that third one's always looming. It seems that just when they, things seem to be bright, bang, the hammer comes down on them again. And maybe, you know, in, in the Lord's mercy, he sees this suffering, and he knows what they're going through on earth and the agony you're in. And you know, that's the agony that he went through for us. And you know, maybe that cuts out some of that purgatory time. And you know, he sees the people suffering so on earth that he's going to say, okay, if you can just hang on, if you can just hang on, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. And then all that suffering in your lifetime is going to seem like nothing when I embrace you in my arms in my kingdom forever. So when we are talking about reading scripture, what we don't want to do is reinvent or reinterpret the church's teachings on what Jesus gave to the apostles for divine revelation. So we don't want to put a spin on it so we can justify a behavior or go against specifically a church teaching. It has to be in the, the realm of of what our Catholic Church believes and teaches. So that's important. So if you're reading a passage, you say, oh, boy, I always committed this sin, and now I, have, I, I didn't realize it wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's consistent with church's teachings, okay? So that's one of the things you're going to know you're on the right path, is that it's not contrary to anything as Catholics we believe in scripture or tradition against the church. And a good catechism, if you get one of the churches, is, is good to have around to make sure. So we don't want to go reading scripture and becoming, you know, our own, uh, our own interpreters to do what we want or justify what we want. Okay. So I gave you that example. And the next thing we want to do is we want to meditate on it. And that means to just slow down and, re I'm, and this is the type of meditation. Now, we're not talking the transcendental meditation that was so popular in the late 60s and the 70s. We're not talking about having a guru and a, a chant and incense burning. That's not what we're talking about. Meditate here. We're going to think. We're going to chew on. Chew on what we re read. Like I had given you my example from this morning. You know, I thought about that and thought about it, and the Spirit led me to those insights, which gave me that joy and peace, and made me feel my spirit and soul closer to Jesus. So that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. So in essence, when we meditate on that, we want to let that passage, or that line, or that word just jump out at us. Even if, you know, like I mentioned Peter in the boat, and something out of the boat, and walking because he had that faith. And like a lot of us, we're strong sometimes in that faith, and it seems that we can walk on water with lo the Lord. And then the cares of everyday life, they get to us. And they can choke that kind of faith out. You know, one of the readings here the last week at Mass was that parable that Jesus gave, how worldly consume, uh, concerns can choke out our f And there's the times that when that happens, we have to be like Peter, and, you know, it could be something just simple like that. Save me, Lord, and trust in him, and then get that and f think about that. Meditate on what that means. Save me, Lord. I'm in big trouble here. I'm in over my head. I need you to pull me out. Give me the wisdom. Send someone into my life to work for you that's working, that you're working through to me to help me in my problem. Let me have some peace in here with that wisdom. Even joy if you give it, Lord. 
and help me here. Let me know you're with me, Lord. Let me know you're with me. I know you're walking with me. And I know you care for me. And I love, I know you love me. And you know that I love you. And you told Peter to feed those lambs and watch over that sheep and feed them. Do the same with because I'm one of those sheep in your fold, Lord. And just let it go and then think what that means to you. Think what avenues that will bring you. And concentrate and meditate on that and let the real Lord really does cherish you. Because he told us, and this may lead you to other a scripture that you read before, or to flip through the Bible and go to a scripture that comes to you. An instance where Jesus tells the apostles that the Father knows when two sparrows fall to the ground, how much more are you worth? And he has your welfare at hand. And you may be able to come up with some solutions, but you will have that intimacy with the Lord. And you may feel a great deal of peace and calmness and even joy coming through it despite your trial and cross. The meditation realize that this is a cross that you're carrying for Jesus. And utter a prayer, Jesus, use this cross that I'm undergoing for the salvation of souls, mine, my family, someone, Lord, use it. Just like that. A, a prayer like that. Because remember what we want to do here with this. The key is what I just mentioned a second ago. The prayer. The prayer. I mentioned about you know, being that sacrifice, that you're suffering on your cross with the sacrifice of Jesus on his. And that's a prayer. And that may be a spontaneous prayer for you, from you, from the heart, to Jesus. And that's the kind of union we're looking for. So we're going to have this prayer communication with our Lord through doing this, through the scripture. And like I mentioned, you can either just start simple. Take the meat, if you have a Magnificat, or you can go online today. There's many apps. And just get the scripture readings today. And just... Pick one, pick the, the, you know, the first reading, pick the psalm, or pick something from the gospel, and then meditate on there. And then what we want to do is, just like I mentioned a minute ago, we want to take that quiet time, and we want to talk to God after meditating and pray to him on what we just read, what we just used our mind to think of, and now what we want to do, the Horatio part, praying, talking to him. God, this is what I, I got in Scripture. This was your word for me today. This is what I think it means. Okay, Lord, please help me. Talk to me now. And then silence. And let the Lord speak to you. And those will be the thoughts that will bubble up inside from the Spirit. And he'll know it's the Lord. And then we've got to take that and be discerning because it's got to be in line with Scripture and the catechism and the teachings of the church. So that's important. That's important. And then we can act on that. And we can have that conversation. And sometimes it's going to be just a simple exchange where your spirit will be elevated. And again, I've mentioned some types of the simplest contemplative prayer is when you, something moved you so much, a beautiful baby or something in nature, and it was just, wow. And that's what you're looking for. And whether you have a sustained period of time, like some of the saints did, or a very short period of time, you take it for what it is and be glad that that gift is given to us. But always remember that we're trying to grow through this closer to Jesus, to have an intimate uh, union with him. Because again, we want to try and break that taskmaster image and try to have a friendship that we really believe he cares for us and he's our friend. And as we know, to have that type of friendship, you've got to keep up that communication. It's going to be a two-way street. Again, it can't be just us unloading on the Lord. He certainly is big enough to take it. And he is, you know, concerned with our petitions. And we don't want to stop asking for things either because that's okay. That's okay. We want to. You know, I remember reading one about St. John Paul II. He said when he prayed, he didn't ask for many things. But as he grew older and, I guess, wiser, he said he asked for much. So we don't want to stop that because, you know, prayer is with a petition. It's praise. 
it's Thanksgiving, and we, we want to do that. So we don't want to stop that either. But we also don't want to make it a monologue on our part where we're asking Jesus for all these things or telling Jesus what we need or doing this. We want to let him speak to us. That's important. And that, I believe, will get easier the more we're able to do this. So that's, that's an important part for us to remember when we're trying to pray. You know, and probably, you know, when I start off in a new year, you know, maybe the wisest thing is not, and for everyone it's different. So I just give you uh, what I think sometimes. You need to um, just take a small part of that and start small and build on it. So you can start with a good, solid foundation. You know, it's, it's like the martial arts. In the martial arts, you, you start with a lot of solid stances with your legs because that's your foundation. Everything, everything that you're going to do is built from that foundation from the legs. Now, the hands in the martial arts are the most important thing, but everything, the difference between that and boxing and things like that is that the karate, karate comes from the legs. So you've got to have a solid foundation to build on your stances and you go from there because if that's weak and your basics are weak, you're not going to accomplish very much. So it's the same thing here to use an analogy. We want to have our foundation and our basics solid so that we can continue to build on them and grow and that, that's going to be important when we do that. But again, and some, like I mentioned, you could try this with the rosary. Maybe you'll stop at just, you'll think of the mysteries like the Agony Garden. It'll be, you know, you'll get through the Our Father, and the, um, you'll get to a Hail Mary. It'll be just Hail Mary full of grace, and boom, you'll know. Your spirit just fills, and you'll just, wow, full of grace, full of grace. And she trusted so completely in God, and she did ponder things, and she wondered how this could be in her humanness like anyone would. And Gabriel told her that anything is possible with God, for nothing is impossible with God. And you'll start to grow from there. And again, if you're in a situation that's tough in your life, maybe that's what it's going to be. Nothing's impossible with God. And you'll get that peace, and you'll get something to hold on to that Jesus will give you and continue that conversation through prayer. You know, and that's very important. Could be the Our Father. I mentioned that's a prayer again, right from Jesus. You know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I mean, when you really think about that, I guess we could spend our lifetime meditating on the Our Father when you think about it. I mean, holy is his name, hallowed. I mean, that's, that's the God of creation that did all these stars and magnificence we see, and many times, including me, take for granted just the fact that we can see and hear and look. Is an incredible gift. And all the magnificence of this earth and his creation and the way the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom are all set up and how everything works and everything is fine-tuned so dramatically. And this is the God that's holy, holy, holy. And, you know, they did that in Scripture three times to <laughs> prove, you know, to the, the people. They wanted them to realize that this is very important. So we're going to do it three times. Make sure you get the message. So God is holy, holy, holy. And his name, and that's one of the commandments, is not to be profane. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I mean, think about that. Because we got into trouble because it wasn't his will. It was our will. We'll get into trouble because, again, it's not his will. It's our will. Individually, we get into trouble because it's my will and not his and when we meditate on that, we may see, we may see when we practice this through scripture and the meditation and the prayer part, that we may think we're doing well on a certain level, but then when we really get something out of scripture and really meditate and then pray to the Lord, he may be taking us somewhere that we thought we were pretty comfortable, but really we weren't doing too well. And we're going to grow from there. And he's going to open up our eyes and through the spirit, see what he really wants. Because, you know, maybe we think we're doing his will, but maybe we're really not. And he'll show us where he wants us. He'll take us by the hand through the Spirit and show us where he wants us to go and lead us there. And we're going to grow in that uh, spiritually big time. So that's a biggie. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we, we want to bring about, remember what Jesus told the apostles, we want to bring about the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So it was here when Jesus was working, or in, in working his miracles and his ministry. So we need to realize that too, that the kingdom of God is right now up here. We can bring that about by the way we live our lives and the actions of our lives and through our church and our ministries and what we can do and how we pray. Because prayer, we've mentioned this before, is very efficacious. I'm sure if you're listening to this program, you've prayed for people and you've seen the res- You've seen prayer in action and how it works and how powerful it is and, as again, how it works. So we, we want to do that. We want to have to bring about the kingdom of God here right now. Not that we're, you know, it's, it's bad to wait until the end of our lives to get into the eternal. But we don't want to wait until judgment day and all that. We want to start bringing it about now. So in essence, we can live the kingdom of God in our hearts now and experience the joys of heaven now. And we can be close to Jesus now on this earthly life. So that's an important part of that prayer. That's a very important part of that prayer. So we've got the Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And this is a big one for most of us, me, you, and everyone. Give us this day our daily bread. Wow. Now, that's where we go to that parable in the masses this week about earthly concerns. And let's be quite honest, we, we have to focus on We are here on the planet. There are requirements that are required of us, our family commitments, commitments to job, our money, and the love of money is the root of all evil, as Jesus said. We do need money. You do need to support yourself. It's just we can't let that become our God. We can't worship, as Jesus said, mammon and him. So it's not evil in itself. It's what we do with that. It's what we do with that. So we need to trust, and I've seen this in my own life, where if we trust in Lord and we are generous, that we cannot outdo Jesus' generosity. Now, he may not give us the castle on a hill, overlooking the ocean, which many of us would like. You know, it wouldn't be too bad waking up to that and going to sleep at night with that ocean waves and waking up with a beautiful sunrise in the morning. But he'll give us what we need. And that's important to remember. Maybe not what we want. And in some cases, he will. But he knows what's best for us. But he'll give us what we need. And we need to trust in him for our daily bread. Because as he says in Scripture that the lilies of the field and the flowers and the birds, they all don't have needs for these things. He tells us that the Father knows what we need, that the Father knows what we need. And, you know, some people say, well, yeah, well, how come there's so many poor people then? You don't think they trust in God? Well, here's one thing. Don't forget, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is about. We have the to change that, folks. And we're all guilty, including myself, of not doing that. But we do have the condition to change that. So that's important to remember when we want to try to fall back on that argument. We have the condition to bring about the kingdom of God and help those people out. You know, certainly in this country, and I'm not, I'm not going to get on a rant here against the people of the United States of America or the wealthy or powerful, because many, 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 many do just are tremendously generous, tremendously so. But I'm talking about where we have this stuff. I mean, to me, it's a crime that food has to be thrown out after, say, 15 minutes on a rack or being in a grocery store for a while. We have the ability to feed people. Maybe we need to get off so much worry about lawsuits and things like that and just chance that maybe once in a while someone might get sick. Maybe someone would even die. But how many people would be helped from that food that we throw away? And maybe we could all conserve a little better or do a little bit because, and give a little extra of our money to help a starving person or work at a food bank or give donations or bring extra food that we've ordered to a place that helps people. And many parish ministries do this. 
and we can give up. Because one of the things that I've seen is that the poor are actually, a lot of them are happy, especially in third world countries. And they're generous to a fault, and they don't have anything. But they're not afraid to give, and they give it with a smile on their face. So there's a lesson there. So we want it to get back to the prayer. We want to trust in God to provide for our needs, and he will, especially if we're generous, and we can start bringing about that kingdom in heaven, or excuse me, the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and helping people out. Because I think if you've helped someone out, you know that you get actually, a lot of times, and this isn't the reason we do it, you get uplifted in the reward more than they do. You know, and then we get to the part, and this is a tough one, isn't it? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh Uh-oh. Someone block. You mean that guy that ripped me off and my business went under and I had to work two menial jobs to feed my family? I got to forgive that guy? I trusted him. I gave him a, a career and he stuck it to me? Yeah. Isn't that hard? And you better believe it's hard. How many families do we know, including our own, where I don't talk to him? They're not going to be invited to this wedding. No way. I'll never call them. As far as I'm concerned, they're finished. Wow. You know, we really need to open up that scripture, do that meditating, and pray to God. Because despite the torture, despite the horrible agony he went through, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And while it doesn't make it right that you might have ripped off and your business went under, that we also don't know the heart of what went on there and why that happened. And I'm not saying it's easy. There are many, many people with a bitterness because they have been really, really hammered by someone's sin. And it's easy to say, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those. It's easier said than done. And we're not talking here about embracing them and being friends and the warm fuzzies. We're talking about, okay, it happened. I'm not happy about what happened to me and where it's, these circumstances have brought me. I've got to let it go because I've been dealt with this, and I've got to deal with it. With the Lord on my side, I'm going to trust in him. But I'll pray for that individual. I'll pray. I'll make it a prayer every day for his soul and a conversion of his heart and to not do this to others. And that's what we're talking about. And that is going to open up a lot of freedom for us if we can, we can do that. If we can do that. But that's something that we've really got to pray about turn to scripture, meditate on that, and pray to the Lord. And he'll he'll help us. I really believe he'll make that clear on what we need to do, especially if that's one of the concrete blocks in our lives, because that's a big one for most of us. That's a big one. We really pray. We really want to pray that we are not in that boat where we cut a family and they're off or a friend or someone and alienate them because of a grudge, because we don't want to die with that. We really don't. And then, it is not into temptation, but deliver us from all of you. Amen. And God knows our temptations. He's given us the great gift of confession. We know we can go to him when we goof and be forgiven. And we need again to forgive. And he doesn't lead us into these things. But this is like St. Paul talks about, once again, you can read this in scripture and maybe it will strike you, about patience and how it leads to other virtues when you're tried and getting stronger. And you can betcha that Jesus Christ, who died on that cross, has delivered us from Satan. Satan now does not have us in his clutches. Satan now doesn't have the death. It's overcome by Jesus. Jesus defeated him. And on the final judgment, on that last day, it will all be said and done. For Christ is the victor, not the devil. So we can take that and keep it close to our heart and soul because Jesus himself has done it and Jesus himself has revealed it. And we know this for a fact. If we know one thing, 
that good triumphs over evil and the devil is defeated once and for all and we know that and then we they say is that we like to say you can take that to the bank because that is our Lord so brothers and sisters again that book praying scripture for a change an introduction so Lectio Divina by Dr. Tim Gray but try it this week just try pray to the spirit open the scripture read it let something strike you meditate on it and then pray about it with our Lord Jesus Christ get some quiet time for yourself and Lord one my prayer for you is to grow closer and closer in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ so that at the end of your life you'll not only get blessings here but at the end of your life he will say come come my servant well done I have prepared a place for you God bless We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.